Hello and welcome to the Advanced Materials Testing uh, webinar here at the Aura Innovation Centre. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping, if you can just keep yourself on mute please, that would be greatly appreciated. If you've got any questions, please ask them in the Q&A. And uh, we don't have the raise hand function, but we also have the chat function, so please do chat away uh, in the background. And I'll just quickly mention as well, this um, is being recorded as well live uh, and will be put out on YouTube later. So welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Ellis Marshall. I'm the technical manager here at the Or Innovation Centre. A bit of my background is 10 years uh, in the chemical industry and then a PhD in 3D and 4D printing. Uh, I use advanced materials and advanced materials testing uh, all the time. It's a very frequent uh, thing that I do and a very frequent technique that I utilise. So this is the ARC and welcome to Advanced Materials Testing. So here we're going to explore a variety of specialist materials. Um, and then we're going to look at different ways your business can go into sustainability and go into all these little niches, basically. Uh, throughout this uh, uh, demonstration series, um, we'll be going through detection of microplastics, uh, discovering metal contaminants, We'll be investigating carbon fiber content. Uh, we'll be calculating CO2 and I'll explain what CO2E is, uh, CO2 equivalents of products. We'll be determining material properties. And lastly, we'll be seeing how we, the Or Innovation Center, can help you. Uh, the target market here is businesses, CEOs, consumers, clients, customers. Uh, we have a very broad base here. Uh, and we are here to help you. So without further ado, we'll get into the detection of microplastics. So detection of microplastics. I'm just gonna play a short little video here, I reckon. a very quick uh, demonstration of what is in our little uh, microscopy area. I say little, it is all behind me as well. Um, it's actually quite a long space and a big space. And this is our microscopy, our advanced materials section uh, here in the Oil Innovation Centre in Invent X. And the way this uh, webinar is going to work is that each, um, each uh, topic, I'm going to do a little case study just to bring you into the environment, bring you into why we're doing this, why we're looking at, say, microplastics, why we're looking at CO2 equivalents, just so we get an idea of why we're doing it and then how we can help and what we can deliver. So a case study, plastics in the environment. Um, I think we can all see where I'm going to go with this one and it will end where you think it's going to end. This is plastic in the sea. Um, plastics are all around us. They're utilised, disposable plastics, different kinds of plastics. And where do they all end up? A lot of them end up in the sea uh, and then they get ground up and beaten up. Oh, and we can also get disposal masks. That's a big thing at the minute. Um, but yeah, they all get broken up, ground up into little microplastics. So these are a very big problem. Um, they, they get into anything and everything. So they can actually get into our food supply and our system through fish. So there's a, there's a big cycle of how microplastics can get into us. Um, but what happens is these bottles, plastic bottles, uh, any types of plastics end up in the sea. They get broken down, but they don't get broken down completely. They get broken down into tiny, tiny microplastics. Uh, there's an example here of them on the finger, but they can go even smaller than that. And I've got a few examples to explain that as well. So here they are on the fingertip. And of course, they go even smaller, probably nanoplastics. And how do they do this? So we've got uh, plastics in Coca-Cola bottles, in fizzy drinks bottles, and they degrade either uh, microbially, physically, chemically. And what happens is they go into the sea. And when they're in the sea, um, they get broken down even further by microbes. These microbes get eaten by fish. We then consume the fish and then have microplastics in our system. 
uh, which then go around in a big circle. So this is a very, very big problem. And it's a very big problem. Hopefully we can get around and it's going to come up uh, a lot. And this is just a quick picture to demonstrate plastics in the ocean. Of course, the plastics are actually inside the fish, not on the fish. That's also a problem. So microplastics can get in your food. So in your sushi, you will have these small little components that are in there. So what we can do is actually uh, take, um, say, a sample. Uh, let's use the example of the fish that we just had on the um, previous slide. We can take the fish. We can actually uh, take out all the, the gubbins of the fish or the guts or the um, or the scales and everything. And what we're left is with tiny particles of plastic. And what we can do with these plastics is analyze them in our uh, advanced materials space here at the AIC, the InventX, and tell you what type of plastic it is and possibly what era it's from. Um, plastics um, down the lines, so from years ago, uh, probably had different chemicals in them, different formulations. It could probably get away with putting a few nasties in the chemicals and into the plastics probably 10, 20 years ago. So they might be still around and they're still circulating in our food systems, in our supply systems. And then we also have the problem of plastics in fabrics, which we've got here. So microplastics um, can exist from plastics that make fabrics. So a lot of your fabrics are plastics in essence. And where do they go? They go into landfill, they can end up in the sea, they can end up uh, in our systems again by the same process as microplastics from bottles. So this is all a big problem. And we can actually analyze and see what is happening on the microscopic level in our facility here. So I used the example of fabric there, but you can also get uh, bottles, so cleaning bottles, for instance. So these are all kinds of bottles and all different plastics and different properties and different formulations. So this is a big list of all the plastics that are available currently. And you'll see one of them says other, but we'll save that for another webinar because that's a whole different story. Um, but currently we can recycle plastics um, at home. Um, one to six, we have all kinds of different plastics. A lot of them can be recycled on the curb. Some we have to take to special places. And why are we recycling? To stop them going into the environment, breaking down to microplastics and ending up in your food. But why is that relevant to a business? Well, a business needs to recycle their plastics to stop it going into the sea, into landfill. And businesses are the biggest producers of plastics and um, products that may end up there. But one good thing that businesses can do is use recycled plastics in their products. And this is where we come in. We can help businesses use these recycled plastics, innovate with recycled plastics, use waste products in a new uh, product, potentially. So that's where we come in. Um, yes, and we can precisely distinguish plastic contaminants as well. So this is another case study that I can just quickly go through. Uh, say you've got a production line, you create plastics for plastic bottles and you get a contaminant in there. You get another plastic that you don't recognize or that shouldn't be there or is a different color or is the wrong color to what you're producing. We can take that sample and analyze it and determine what exactly it was or is and how it might affect your product or process. So uses of um, our equipment, especially for um, advanced materials and for microplastics, is that we can actually play with formulations. So whether that is a recycled plastic formulation, potentially, maybe you've got a new bottle that you've uh, designed and you want to change the formulation and use different uh, materials that might be biodegradable, we can help with that. Maybe quality analysis, where you've got a product, you don't know what's in it, you want to analyze it or you want to verify um, another product and check what is in that or verify your supply chain checking what you're getting or what you're getting on paper is what you're actually physically receiving 
We can also do analysis of mixed plastics and also composites. And then if you've got an unknown sample, we're happy to uh, take it in under all the health and safety precautions and try and determine what it might or could be uh, using all the techniques we have here at the Or Innovation Centre. And they're all behind me here, which is brilliant. Um, I won't go into too much detail about every single um, instrument behind me, but uh, using the expertise here at the University of Hull, there's always someone on, on hand who knows what this might be, what that might be, and how that might help you as a business. So this is a quick one, and I'll mention it later as well. Um, um, it's mentioned later in a, a bit of a, a throwback to our Festival of Green Innovation. Um, but this, I'll give it away, it's a tea bag. Uh, and what I was doing was actually searching for microplastics in tea bags. So this is a consumer product, and there's been loads of tests done online if you want to Google microplastics in tea bags to look for uh, evidence of them. And in some tea bags, yes, there is microplastics, but in a lot of them, there isn't. So uh, this structure on the right hand side is the tea bag. It's a very unorganized uh, mess of strings and fibers all glued together. And then on the bottom left is the tea leaf itself. So this is an example of how we can also use microscopes, which I'll get onto later as well. Um, but looking down in the micron layers, in the, in the millimeters, microns, nanometers, to look at your product. So this is stuff that you can't see with the eye, that you don't appreciate with the eye. And um, before I did this experiment, I never appreciated that the tea leaves actually physically dried up tea leaves with the stem attached. And that the tea bags are an ordered um, state. They are just a mess of fibers encapsulating the tea bag. It's brilliant. I didn't know this before I looked at microscopy. So that was a, a quick overview of detection of microplastics. So um, again, we can use this equipment behind us to look for microplastics or play with formulations of round plastics, reuse plastics, reuse waste materials, waste products, and also look for plastic contaminants. And we're just gonna move on to looking at metal contaminants now. So these are a lot harder to distinguish, but a lot more problematic as well. So that was a quick video of our microscopy. That was our scanning electron microscope, uh, looking at the tea leaves there, um, which is just behind me, right at the back in my background. Um, so what we can do is actually use that technique to detect, detect metals. So this is um, any metal. So here I've got an example of gold and um, aluminium. Um, but this is any metal from um, on the periodic table, from lithium, or beryllium probably actually, all the way up to uranium. So if you want to do radioactive materials, there is potential, but um, we don't really look at that here. What we're looking at is contaminants such as lead, tin, um, maybe alloys as well, so bronze. We're looking at how they uh, might appear in your product by accident, or how they're in there from another process or technique, and in what quantity they're in there. So we can actually detect that. So um, it happens, metal contaminants happen in your product. Uh, they might come from different sources, uh, depending on what your product is. Um, say if it's on a production line, again, uh, you're having sheets of plastic come up and you get uh, a stripe of um, an unknown material on your um, production line. You don't know what that is. And maybe it's a yellow um, long stripe all across your material. And what that might be is potentially uh, a metal-based paint. Um, so paints and pigments are actually quite common sources of contamination. 
but just by looking at it, you don't know what it is or where it's come from. Um, stabilizers, catalysts, they can all be sources of contaminants in your products, weathering of minerals. Uh, if you're doing a product that involves volcanic, volcanic activity, you never know, you might end up with bits of iron in there. Uh, agriculture and vegetation easily get metal contaminants in there, uh, say from heavy metals, from uh, pesticides and anything like that. So maybe it's a soil sample you've got and we can look at that for metal contamination. Maybe it's a bit of ash from a process, from a fossil fuel combustion. Maybe it's waste. Maybe your business is in metals and you want to check. There's a whole range of sources and you might not know where it's come from and we can help you figure that out. So we're very problem solving here at the ARC, very dynamic and can help you solve your problems. So there I was talking about um, paints. So this is an example of one. This is actually a lead based paint on a wall. And what could happen is that over time it might just uh, flake off and it might actually get in your product, in your process. But you don't know where it's come from and you can actually determine uh, through our techniques what sort of paint it's come from. It might have come from a building that's from the 1920s. And now you know that all the lead paint is coming off the walls and you can change your processes and everything else. So I think the next example um, is a case study. So this is metal in plastic production. So this is actually uh, a bit of plastic um, that's come uh, from a potential client. And you can see the plastic is grey and what they think is metal contaminant in uh, white there. So they wanted to just see uh, what's happening, why they're getting these little white specks all over the place. So what we did was put it in our microscope and had a look at it. And um, we can all see from this image, you can't really tell much, it's very, very small. It's um, 50 microns or so, it's very, very tiny. And now we're wondering if there's some metal contamination getting in there, maybe a bit of lead-based paint. Um, so what we did was use this technique uh, to actually look at the pattern of where a certain metal may be. So on the right hand side is actually a dotted map of where the metal is in this product. And it doesn't match what is actually on the product because where you see the little white blob, there's no metal contamination. So that white blob isn't metal, but there's metal everywhere else. And in this sample, it's actually iron that's um, involved in this sample. Um, and show there's very small specks of it all over the place. And these are probably nano size amounts of iron all dotted around the place. But that still doesn't give us um, a solution of what that white blob was. Um, so to help us even further, what we actually do is create a 3D map, a heat map of where these are to try and determine what is happening in the sample. And again, you can't really see in this white blob if there's any metal there's metal everywhere else. So we can rule out metal contamination because they expected to find iron in this sample. But you can use this to look for another contaminant. You can look, use this to look for lead. You can use this to look for uh, tin, bronze, uh, stainless steel. So this leads me on to looking at alloys. So alloys are typically two or three metals maybe that are combined together in specific quantities. And maybe you've got a supply that you're not quite convinced with. Uh, you're not quite convinced they're giving you the proper proportions of metal. Um, so copper to zinc, maybe to make uh, bronze. Um, maybe they're not giving you the right ratios. And we can actually check that and see what's happening. Uh, we can actually check metals in your production line, see if they're getting in there. Maybe you're doing a, a combustion process and getting ash. We can check that ash for contamination, metal contamination. Maybe you're a water processing plant and you've got heavy metals that you want to check for in your water. We can do solids, aqueous and gases here. Uh, like I say, metal alloy check as well. And we can also look at unknown substances, whether it's a plastic or a metal. We could potentially look to find out what it is. So this is all very helpful and useful in your products. Uh, so that was a quick metal contaminants uh, recap, basically. Um, and if you have any questions, please do ask them in the Q&A, in the chat. 
um, please go ahead and uh, ask me uh, anything really. And uh, maybe you've got a product or maybe you've got a problem. Just get in touch and we'll see how we can help. Uh, the email address is aic.aura at home.ac.uk. So we're just going to move on then to investigating carbon fiber content. So again, we've got a quick video, hopefully. So here we're actually using microscopes and microscopy. So this is another technique that we can utilize here at the Oral Innovation Center. And what we're actually going to look at here is carbon fiber in this sample. So this is a sample that has been uh, 3D printed uh, and it's got carbon fiber on the outside and carbon fiber in the actual material itself. But we're going to analyze the distribution of carbon fiber. So maybe you, you're working with a product that has fiberglass in it. So we showed a picture of five glass early. We do a lot of work with uh, glass fibers. Maybe you've got a product that uses a lot of them. We can actually um, analyze them here at the Your Innovation Center. So here's our little sample, and we're gonna put it on the microscope and have a quick look at it. So you can see here then, um, you've got the curved surface, and on there is actually embedded carbon fibers, long, long strands of carbon fiber. And in all the hexagons, there's very, very short fibers of um, carbon in there. So what we can do is look at them under the microscope and figure out how it's laid down, what the surface quality is. Maybe you've got two sections of carbon fiber or a glass fiber composite that you've uh, welded together or sonically welded together or electronically welded together. Uh, and we can have a look at that weld maybe around two components and look at the integrity of the weld. So here's our two components and in a second we'll see a close-up image of what's happening. So these are two images we've got here. Top left uh, is the short carbon fibers and you can actually see all the fibers in there. So this is really helpful for looking at the distribution of carbon fiber because you don't want it all in one place on your manufacturing process. If you have it all in one place, you'll probably get weak spots or you'll have too much carbon fiber and there won't be any composite plastic in there to help. And then the second top um, or bottom right one is actually all the layers of carbon fiber that are just laying on top of each other. You can actually see little strands of carbon fiber sitting there. So it's very important to need to look at this um, in microscopic detail. And so our next image is actually uh, a close-up. Uh, this is a fracture in, uh, in our carbon fiber component that I've looked under the scanning electron microscope for. Um, so this is actually a very, very tiny fracture in a product. You wouldn't see this with the naked eye, but if it's already fracturing now, imagine putting it under pressure or under testing or any load, that fracture would become so much wider and bigger. So this is a potential fault in the, uh, in the making. Uh, that could be a big fault coming up in the future. So we're very all about fault finding, problem solving, and uh, finding out what's, what's wrong. Maybe you don't know anything was wrong and you just want to check. We can help you with that. So again, uh, just quickly the uses. Uh, distribution of fibres. Uh, we can quality check a mix. So check you haven't got too much carbon fibre in one place against another. Fracture check, uh, weld check, sonic welding and exposed glass fibers so you may have exposed exposed glass fibers on your product uh, and when introduced with a chemical these could actually lead to small sites um, of chemical interaction and could actually destroy your product potentially 
So there's all kinds of little testings we can do. And what I would suggest is if you manufacture, if you produce products, get in touch with us and see how we can help you. So that's investigating carbon fiber content. Um, I think we're just going to move on to, I know we're going to have any questions. So if we've got any questions, um, please ask them in the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we'll just take a quick breather to maybe just recap on everything we've done. So we've looked at microplastics, uh, we've looked at carbon fiber, and we've looked at metal contamination as well. And uh, we're looking how these are examples of how we can help you in this very small section of Invent X, the advanced materials zone. We have other zones here as well in, uh, in Invent X, which belongs in the Or Innovation Centre. Uh, we have 3D printing zone. We have uh, a green energy zone, a printed circuit board zone. And these will all pop up very soon on, a, a, on our next webinar series. So please do look out for that. So I'll just move on. So we're going to go on to calculating CO2. And what is CO2E? So CO2, coal is, as we probably all know, is a big emitter of carbon, either carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. And um, we've got a nice pretty picture of coal there, but this is what we want to get away from. And what causes all this CO2 is combustion of coal products. But it's not only coal that generates CO2. It could be anything that burns potentially. So here I've got a cigarette because cigarettes have all sorts of contamination in there that burn off. And everything in that cigarette has a, a CO2 equivalence. So it's equivalent carbon output. So just because it's not carbon doesn't mean um, it's not damaging or harming the environment. For instance, um, a rocket going up into space, uh, that's got a, a large emission. Burning books, burning paper, a large emission of carbon. Uh, forest fires, natural, um, natural problems occurring in our environment from processes as well. These could cause problems as well. So welding, all the exhaust fumes, that isn't just CO2 and carbon monoxide. That is all these nasty chemicals which have a much larger impact on our environment than CO2 itself. Again, I come back to the plastic bottles and oceans and the carbon fiber um, composite we were talking about earlier as well. We've also got metal, brass, that could be a problem. And they all lead to global warming. So this is a, a quick graph. Let's pause that there. Uh, a quick graph of the uh, CO2 equivalents. So we've got CO2 in there. Um, what it's just one ton of CO2. Um, but if you have a methane, methane coming off a product, that's 25 times the amount of CO2. Uh, we've got N2O, 298 times. Nasty chemicals such as um, uh, chemicals used in chillers, substations, aluminium smelting, refrigerants, industrial gases they have a much higher impact on our environment than just CO2. But why does that matter to us at the Or Innovation Center? Well, what we're about is low carbon innovation. And what we can do here is actually measure the carbon output of your product by combusting it in very, very small amounts. So we can see if carbon dioxide comes off your product, or maybe it's an alternative, maybe it's sulfur dioxide, maybe it's heavy metals, and we can look at the CO2 equivalents of all those bad chemicals coming off so that you can better understand your product. So how we can also help is maybe you could switch to low carbon alternatives. Maybe you could formulate with us and look at recycled plastics. Maybe you could help generate your own closed loop system. So take, say you generate coffee cups, maybe you take in the used coffee cups, recycle them into more coffee cups. Uh, and we can help innovate away from oil derived products and help you un understand your material emission even better.
So this is a, a quick example. So on the right, say we've got a stainless steel water bottle. It actually is four kilograms of CO2 equivalents um, because of its, its weight, its uh, manufacture and its transportation. But let's say we turn it into a plastic water bottle or a plastic bottle it actually uses less resources. The production is a lot less in CO2 and we use a lot less in transportation. And then we're going to come on to uh, my favourite topic, which is actually low carbon cement. So we have talking a lot about plastics, about products, but actually buildings and cement generate a lot of CO2. And that can come from all the components involved in it. And also when CO2, uh, uh, when cement mixes with water, it generates heat and CO2 is emitted. So we need to look at ways of lowering our carbon output. We can do that by using low carbon cements, for instance. And we can actually help here generate those new products. We have techniques to measure flow of materials, mixes of materials, how materials cure, which we'll get onto in material properties as well. There's a lot we can do here for uh, any material that you might may have or may want to use and we can also look into co2 capture so we're doing a lot of research in co2 capture so a quick recap of the calculating co2e and then we're going to move on to determining material properties so uh, co2 so we can uh, take your product and analyze how much co2 or co2 equivalent it uh, gives off so if you're looking to be greener and more sustainable in the future, you want to understand your product and process uh, even more. So we're just going to move on to determining material properties. So what we're going to do here is actually a throwback to our Festival of Green Innovation that happened in March this year. Um, so it's a little clip of uh, myself recorded in the advanced materials section. Uh, talking a bit about chemicals and rheology and all sorts of lovely chemicals happening in there. And uh, the voice that you'll hear interviewing me is uh, the one and only Kofi Smiles from the BBC. Um, but he's actually off screen, so you won't see him, but you'll hear him. Uh, if you want to see the full uh, Festival of Green Innovation, it's actually available uh, on YouTube. Uh, just Google it on YouTube and you'll find it. So I'm just going to play this video and um, I'll be back in a second. We are here in the advanced materials zone. Now we are currently enclosed in a little, a little bit bigger than a cupboard, but you know, I guess this is where you've been spending most of your time. What goes on here? Yeah, it's a, it's a very spacious cupboard. This is where you live usually. Uh, so what goes on here is we do a lot of testing on materials and products in this room. So we have lots of great boxes, but these great boxes can do amazing things. Okay, please tell me about these boxes then. Mother yeah. boxes, what we So we've got one great box right behind me, uh, this great box. Um, so this actually takes really, really tiny images, um, so really close-up images of lots of materials. So if you if you're with me, mm. um, I'd like to play a quick little game with you. Go on. It's only a little game. Go on then. What, do I win little. prizes? You win a prize. Okay. You get to choose a material. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, do you know what looks the most inviting? That pink one. I'm going to go. Pink for that. one. Yeah, yeah. Good. We'll come to that later then. Okay. <laughs> uh, so behind me, you can see an image. Yeah. Um, so this image, um, I'm wearing one, you're wearing one, everyone in this room and in this whole AIC is wearing one. Can you sort of guess what it is? Oh, I'm just so saying. this image behind me. Um, it looks like it could be some stitch, some sort of material like yep. a shirt, cotton yep. wool. Cotton. cotton. So it's yeah. exactly cotton. So each one of these strands is a thread. Oh, that's one then, thread? Yeah, that's one thread. And then inside that is the thread of a thread. Wow. So we're looking down at the micron level. Jeez. So that's an idea of how close we're going. Okay. Very zoomed in. Right, right. So I'll take you through sort of a journey. So uh, this next one, uh, everyone in the UK probably has one of these in the morning. Um, so I would say you have it with hot water, maybe a bit of milk, lemon, maybe. Oh, uh, cup of tea? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a tea bag. Oh, right. Okay. So you can see here uh, on the left here, that's, can you tell what that is? Uh, which one? The one on the top or the bottom? Bottom. 
Um, oh, if you're crumpled up, usually it would be like so on a tree. Leaf. Yeah. There we go. So that's the leaf, and then the rest of it is a tea bag. So wow. you can see that the tea leaf won't escape the tea bag because the holes in the tea bag yeah, are too yeah. small for the leaf to escape. Okay, okay. So we can do this quality assessment of materials in this room okay. and check that your material is actually fit for purpose. So yeah. a tea bag is fit for purpose. Brilliant. Uh, that... If the holes are too big, then your tea is going to go everywhere and you're not going to get your elong, what is it, Darjeeling tea. <laughs> so it's all, it's all essentially quality assurance. Then. Quality assurance is what this room is all about. Okay. So um, A quick number one. So quality assurance, this is fractures. So here we're looking at a fracture, um, a microscopic fracture. Again, this is like 300 microns. So a human hair is 30. Right. <laughs> so it's a very, very tiny sort of fracture. Okay. Um, and so we can see one here. This is actually a fracture in a solar panel. Right, right. So we have lots of solar panels here at the ASC, and this is just one of them. And we can do this investigation on loads of different materials. Wow. Um, yeah, and on the right hand side there as well, that's all the crystals inside a solar panel. Um, so you'll be able to see all them, which you can't usually see with the naked eye. So how does all this benefit businesses then? Does it make sure you, you're working with the right materials, you're getting the right products in, and more importantly, if any, you're working with anyone, you're shipping the right goods out? Yeah, so we can work with them in multi-steps. So um, we can do the start. So if we're at the start of manufacture, we can look at the reagents they're using mm. and quality test them. Um, we can look at the process, so how the process is going, how they're mixing uh, materials together. And then also at the end, the quality assurance, checking that it's all right and all fine and dandy. So I've got one more image. So this um, explains my quality assurance perfectly. So this is just a nondescript bit of ash. Oh, like ash from like a, any, any bit of item, any item, any burnt item? Yeah, any burnt item, a bit of ash. Okay. But um, it's come from a big factory where they burn a lot of stuff and they want to check what's actually in this ash. Wow. And just by looking at it, it's just a grey blob. Hmm. But um, using some technology in this grey box behind me, we can actually add colour to it. And we can actually look at the iron in there. It's filled with iron. So you, you wouldn't take this ash and put it on your compost. Because it's filled with iron that's going to contaminate your whole compost. Wow. Um, and then we, we can go one step further and visualise it 3D as well. Okay. So you can have a heat map of where this material is. So say if you had a supplier um, abroad that gave you some material, you can check what's in it exactly, yeah. what element is in there. Can I ask, and forgive me if this is a stupid question, yeah. would you work with the police considering how in depth your cameras were? Because when you said it was full of iron, I was like, oh, uh, my head went to blood. Do you know what I mean? Like a crime scene investigation. Do you ever sort of um, find yourself mingling with like the, um, I guess, with law enforcement and that sort of, um, those, sort of those sort of groups? Um, we could do, yes. Yeah. We could have some involvement with sort of forensic teams potentially. Yeah. Um, we don't do it currently, but uh, we look at more of the business side, so more of the SMEs rather than okay. the big industry. So um, how, why is it important to have equipment and to have people like yourself working within the Humber? Um, it's important to have all this stuff um, and this whole room and this, um, advanced materials section yeah. um, because we can um, analyse and look further into uh, materials. Oh, I'm going around in circles. Sorry. Um, Do you want me to go from the top? Yeah, go from that bit again. Okay. Yeah. You right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, why is it important to have facility? Um, sorry. <coughs> so, why is it important to have an advanced materials facility um, here in the Humber? Yeah, so it's great to have uh, this, this zone here because uh, just by being in the Humber, we're low carbon. We can go to any industry in Hull and the Humber region mm. and interact with them. You're not going to London or abroad to try and find these services. We're literally down the road from you. Okay. Um, so your low carbon uh, emissions is, is brilliant by coming to us. I was going to say, and is that how you guys, uh, guys, is that how you guys contribute to, I guess, you know, um, minimal outputs of wastage? Yeah, that's how we contribute um, by being here. I guess we have the expertise. We have the expertise in this room. We have the expertise at the University of Hull, which are only a stone's throw away mm. rather than a plane away um, in a different country. So we're contributing by being here in the Humber, supporting SMEs in the Humber. Brilliant. So, um, Ellis, what happens now? Do I get to take my pink goo home with me? or? Yes, you on? can take your pink goo. <laughs> so uh, I will explain why I've got all these goos. So in this um, zone as well, we not only look at stuff microscopically, mm. Um, we also look at materials and how they react and interact. So we work with companies on oil formulations, mm. on, um, on soaps, 
um, on lots of different formulations. I just want to explain a few here that I've got here. Oh, please. Um, so let's start with your pink goo. So this is actually just shampoo, but it's got um, viscosity to it. So it's quite thick and quite gloopy. So we can measure exactly how gloopy this material is. <laughs> and that's important because your cheap shampoo might be really thin and doesn't really work. Whereas your most expensive one will probably lather up really well and it will look really good and you'll smell awesome afterwards. I do have to ask, um, does um, gloopiness have a measurement of a, as a scientific term for it? Yes. Like? Yeah. So oh, it does. Gloop okay. does have a, a sort of, I would call it fixotropy or even viscosity. Okay. So each of these materials has a different viscosity. So here we've actually got sun cream. Again, this is quite thick and viscous. Mm. So if you put it on your skin, it will um, go over nicely. What's also similar to this is probably paint. Obviously you wouldn't get the two confused. Mm. You'll end up painting yourself, which would be horrendous. Um, but paint needs a good viscosity to go on the wall yeah. and stay on the wall and not come down the wall mm. and make drip marks and everything. Um, so yeah, we've also got oil. Oils come in liquids and solids. So here we've actually got olive oil with coconut oil in. So we can measure um, the viscosity, but also at what temperature they melt. Wow. So this is quite important for degradation of materials. Um, you need to know when they're melting, because if you put it in an application that's at 80 degrees, you want to know it can stand at 80 degrees. Mm. Um, so this is the cool one that we're all waiting for. This is corn flour. So this is the one that you can punch and it won't go anywhere. But when you slowly put your finger in, you'll be able to go all the way in. But as you pull it out, you get corn flour everywhere. So this is important because we can measure this in-house. Yeah. And another thing we can do, this is the messy one. So this is shaving foam. Shaving foam just looks normal as it is. But if you did this, you get foam. So this is important because we actually have companies involved here who actually formulate products like this. And they need to know that when you put this on your face and have two strokes, you get a nice foam. And if you don't, that's not a shaving cream. Right. So actually we work with a lot of businesses uh, on their formulations in this room. And I, guess, I guess the perfect example of this because they all are household items, isn't it? And I guess we take that for granted in terms of the processes that go through, the chemical changes and stuff, but you guys are here to make sure, well, above all that they're safe and that they do the job. Yes, so they have to be safe and they have to do the job. And that's definitely, definitely important. You don't want um, bleach on your hair. No. Um, you don't want um, shaving cream going anywhere else other than your face. So yeah, so we're making a stand here by being important. Awesome, uh, Ellis, thank you very much. So thank you very much for watching that. So that was uh, Kofi Smiles at the Festival of Green Innovation. Um, and we were talking about our advanced materials section. If you go back and look at it, we actually talked about all our sections. We went into digital zone, green energy zone, um, uh, where else did we go? 3D printing zone as well. Went all into these different zones and Kofi was a great presenter. So thank you very much again, Kofi, uh, for coming to host our Festival of Green Innovation. So we're just gonna now go into determining material properties. And this kind of works as a recap of all the other components and it brings in everything else we've talked about today. So uh, you've seen this plastic bottle now probably three or four times. Um, and we can determine material properties of that bottle. We can tell you what plastic it is. Uh, probably what era the plastic bottle was uh, created as well. So how can we do that? What we actually do is look at different melting points of plastics. Here I've got an ice cream just to show you melting points. Um, but we can, we can do this in quite a scientific way. Uh, we can look at different melting points of plastics or different melting points of maybe something that you bring in. Maybe it's not a plastic, maybe it's a composite, maybe it's a metal. Maybe it's a product that we never worked with before, maybe a foam, maybe a 3D printing filament. And what we do is we can look at melting points of it. That's just one simplistic um, technique we can use to look at your product. And that's how we differentiate plastics. Um, we can also look at waxes. So this is just some wax candles melting. I just wanted to show that we can do different things. This is epoxy. We can actually look at how, when you add A and B together, how long it takes for them to cure, how quickly, what happens if you add too much of A against too much of B? 
and what happens if it's at elevated temperatures. We can look at all these little bits and bobs and see how it interacts and how it works and the time that it takes for it to set. We can look at glues, how long it takes for a glue to become tacky and then set, how it interacts with uh, maybe two bits of plastic, maybe a bit of plastic and a bit of metal. Does it adhere properly? How does it adhere? We can look at welds, welds integrity. So how well the weld is holding together to maybe plastics. Maybe it's actually a metal weld you want to investigate. We can analyze that and have a look at it. Um, and also maker products are actually a big thing and you don't want to send them into the waste as well. But we can actually look at formulations of makeup products and other formulations available on the market, maybe washing up liquids, maybe powders, maybe foams, maybe um, fairy liquid. We can look at different things and analyse it and see what the material properties are. Um, I'll come back to this one, but this one is actually um, salt. So we can look at how things crystallise and over how long it takes them to crystallise. So this is important when you're looking at, uh, say, crystals, uh, not just salt crystals, but other types of crystals in the environment. Uh, you can use it when looking at plastics and how they crystallize. There's all kinds of questions here that we could ask. Uh, we can look at mechanical properties. So here we've got a picture of a ball being squeezed. So this is a representation of something elastic being squeezed. And we can look at how much force it can take before it breaks, how much force it takes before it can come back. Uh, we can look at elastic, toughness, uh, all kinds of properties of a material. Uh, we can also look at metals and how they interact and how they wear as well. Um, this is an example of elastics and how they interact and how they're used. Uh, again, toughness, this is a bit of bamboo. We can analyze the strength of bamboo in your product or how it would uh, interact with your product or how it would work in your product. Is it as tough as your current product? Maybe you put bamboo in a coffee cup and want to know if it can take the heat. Uh, maybe you've got metals again and they're wearing. We can actually look at how long it takes them to wear. And we can also uh, model them. So this is actually our previous webinar uh, on CAD. We can actually model how it will take a mechanical strain or mechanical stress or how it will achieve if your your product doesn't exist yet which is quite a really useful technique to use especially if, if you don't spend the money creating your product yet and you just want to investigate how it will work so that was a, a quick fling through of determining material properties and we're just going to go through how the aic can help you Maybe you as a business. We can help your business innovate, basically, but uh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, we can help your business reduce its carbon emissions in multiple amount of ways, especially with this new uh, green agenda coming around as well. Build back greener. Uh, we can help your company do that. Maybe you've already looked into solar panels and maybe you've looked into making your building green. But have you made um, ways into looking into your product and making that a greener product to reduce your carbon? or maybe create a closed loop cycle. We can look at sustainable solutions with you and help innovation. 
uh, we can accelerate our ideas, uh, we can provide expertise. We are the University of Hull, we have academics. They might be experts in your area or in the area you want to look at. And here at the Innovation Centre, University of Hull, we can also showcase the Humber region and help you connect with maybe other businesses around the Humber, around the UK or internationally. We have a, a huge client base, uh, not just the Humber. We work with clients all over the globe. Um, so that was a quick um, overview of how the AIC can help you. So we've just got some questions I just want to answer in the Q&A. Um, the first one, uh, how long does the testing process take and are you able to provide guidance uh, for the next steps if the material isn't durable enough for my product? Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your question. Um, how long does the process take? Um, from quotation to doing the test, if it's a, a nice simple test, it can be done uh, within the week, so a few days. Um, if it's a more uh, invest investigative method or it requires a lot more input, uh, we can look at doing over that a series of weeks maybe. Maybe we need more input from you. Maybe it's a, a greater product, uh, project than just a commercial job. So if that's the case, maybe there's a chance that this could be a funded project through our ERDF streams and our innovation managers can come on board and guide you through that process. Um, or maybe it's a, a longer job and we can do it over commercial, or maybe it leads to uh, knowledge transfer partnerships or PhD students, if you've got a really difficult question that you want investigating. We can do anything from the simple to the complex. Again, we are a university, that's what we're here for. We're here to help. And we're here to be this uh, problem solver in the region. Uh, and so the second question we've got, um, are you able to provide um, the best material spec. So I can see that. Um, the recommended material for a product to analyze different materials. To... So, yeah, I um, can't quite see the question. I read off a big board and I can't quite see it. Um, are you able to analyze a product and different materials? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we can take a, a product. So, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so, we can take a product and analyze it for a specific purpose. Um, so say you've got an elastic material and you want to analyze it for its elasticity and warp when it breaks. We can take either the product spec and have a look at how it should perform. Or we can look at how it will perform if it hasn't got a product spec. And um, so we are this innovation step before it goes to certification in some steps as well. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Um, and then we've got another question. Can you test how much lead is in a wave solder bath? Um, it depends in what um, form the lead is coming in. So are we talking solid? Are we talking it's an aqueous solution? Are we talking powder? Um, either way, we could probably analyze how much lead is in that solution through different techniques. So we could either look at microscopy techniques or combustion techniques. Um, probably for lead as well, we don't want to combust it and send it everywhere. So we'd probably look at microscopy techniques to analyze how much lead is in that sample. So we'd have to take a very, very small sample of it to analyze it. So yeah, thank you very much for your question there. So I hope I've answered it. If not, uh, please do get in contact with AIC.aura at hold.ac.uk and we can have a conversation about it and probably schedule a chat about it as well. So hopefully through this webinar, we've explored a variety of specialist, specialist materials that could maybe um, improve sustainability, enhance performance. Maybe it's um, going to ensure greater cost effectiveness by having a closed loop um, plastic cycle. But what we ultimately aim to do is transform your success. It's all about working with businesses, small, large, medium businesses, uh, and helping you become a, a more low carbon innovator. So uh, I think I've answered all the questions so far. So if you do have any more questions, please do just email aura, uh, aic.aura at hold.ac.uk and your question will be forwarded on to the relevant person. And with that, I want to 
Thank you very much for joining us. And I also want to say, please do check out our previous series on 3D printing. So we did a whole webinar series on 3D printing and computer aided design. So please do go check that out. That's now available on YouTube. Um, as for this, um, this webinar today will be available on YouTube. And we have future series coming up. So please do watch out for them. I think our next one is printed circuit boards coming up next month. So please keep an eye out for that and please do attend. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch again, aic.aura at hall.ac.uk. Uh, please find us on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. We do a lot of chat around there. Uh, so finally, I would like to say thank you. So thank you for the team for helping me host this event. Um, and thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining me. And I shall see you very soon. Thank you. <laughs>